from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is David Mao, and I have the privilege of serving as a law librarian here at the Library of Congress, and I want to welcome you all to the Library of Congress today for this very special event. Um, first proclaimed by President Eisenhower in 1958, Law Day is a national day to celebrate law and its role in the foundation of America. Congress officially designated May 1st as Law Day in 1967, and for all of the lawyers out there, I want to let you know it's officially codified at 36 U.S.C. Section 113, in case you're interested. <laughs> so the Law Library of Congress has helped celebrate Law Day for many years, and I'm very, very delighted that we're able to do so again today. And I want to first thank the Friends of the Law Library of Congress, and our President uh, Kim Pham is sitting right here, as well as the Library of Congress's Office of Opportunity uh, inclusiveness and compliance, because it, without their, those two entities, we would not be here today. And so thank you very much for their help and support. Now, over the years, the American Bar Association has acted as the national sponsor for the day. And just to let everyone know, the American Bar Association has a standing committee. It was the second standing committee formed by the ABA almost 100 years ago, I think. Uh, the uh, ABA Standing Committee on the Law Library of Congress, which supports us greatly. And thank you, Judge Sessions, for being here. We serve on the uh, board for the uh, Standing Committee. Thank you, sir. And so the ABA has acted as a sponsor, as I would mentioned. And, and I believe they have provided a natural platform for dialogue and discussion on the fundamental legal principles and civic traditions of the rule of law and those contributions to the freedoms that Americans enjoy. And so. Um, it's especially appropriate that we are here this year with a national theme of realizing the dream equality for all because it provides an opportunity for a di great discussion on the movement in America for civil and human rights and the impact it has had in promoting the idea of equality under the law. This theme, I think, is particularly appropriate this year as, because it, marks, it also marks the, this year also marks the 150th anniversary of the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation, and also the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And so to help mark this event and these other two uh, uh, occurrences, we have arranged to have the library's copy of the dra first draft of the Emancipation Pro Proclamation, which was handwritten by President Abraham Lincoln, and we will have it on display after the conclusion of this program. Uh, the document was first read by the president to his cabinet on July 22nd, 1862. And I just want to add a footnote in there that that's almost 30 years to the date after the formation of the Law Library of Congress. We were created in July of 1832. So I think that's uh, particularly relevant as well. We will show that document for 30 minutes because we are time limited uh, in terms of light uh, access to light and it will be on display outside of this room. Just a, a couple of housekeeping notes though. Uh, no food and drink close to the uh, document. So if afterwards there, there will be a, a small reception, please try to keep that in here. If you go look at the documents outside, well, we appreciate you keeping the food and drink away. And it will only be uh, for 30 minutes. We will have staff from the Library of Congress, uh, colleagues from the Manuscript Division, as well as the Book Conservation Section, who will help answer some questions for you about the document if you have any. So turning to our program, uh, this year's commemoration is uh, a new one for us, a new format, as you will see. And we are very pleased to welcome Carrie Johnson, uh, the justice correspondent from National Public Radio, as our program moderator. She reports on justice issues, law enforcement matters, and legal affairs for our NPR's flagship programs, Morning Edition, and All Things Considered, as well as uh, other newscasts uh, and, and NPR.org generally. She uh, is... Uh, we're very well known to everyone here, I know, and uh, in addition to her work on those publications, she regularly moderates or appears on legal panels for the American Bar Association, the American Constitution Society, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and others. Uh, so we are very, very delighted to have her be our moderator, and she will introduce the rest of our guests. So please join me in welcoming Carrie. Thank you. <laughs> 
David, and thanks for all of, um, to all of you for coming today. It's my great honor to be the moderator of this panel, and um, I know you'll be as excited as I am as soon as I tell you a little bit more about the people who are going to be talking today. First to my left is Risa Golubov. She's a professor of law and history at the University of Virginia and a visiting scholar here in the library's John W. Kluge Center. Kluge Center. Golubov teaches constitutional law, civil rights litigation, and legal and constitutional history, and she directs the University of Virginia's joint JDMA program in history. In 2001, she received the University of Virginia's All University Teaching Award. She's an affiliated scholar at the Miller Center and faculty affiliate at the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies. In 2012, she was named a distinguished lecturer by the Organization of American Historians. She's written widely, including the award-winning book, The Lost Promise of Civil Rights. It explores alternative understandings of civil rights in the era before Brown v. Board of Education. And she earned her JD from Yale Law School and her PhD in history from Princeton. Oh, and her AB from Harvard, sorry. <laughs> very, very well credentialed. To my left is Kirk Rasko. He's director of the library's, uh, Library of Congress's Office of Opportunity, Inclusiveness, and Compliance. He most recently served as director of Equal Opportunity and Compliance at the University of so South Florida, a school that ranks with a diverse population of 45,000 students as the third largest university in the Florida state system, really big. He served as a member of the Council on Equal Opportunity and Access in the State University System of Florida and of the Diversity Oversight Committee. He also served for two years as director of the Civil Rights Division of the Broward County Office of Equal Opportunity in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He also served for seven years as the Director of Equal Opportunity Programs for the LA Unified School District, the second largest school district in the United States. Um, Rasko is a graduate of Northwestern University and Boston University School of Law. To my right is Jeffrey Rosen, Professor of Law at George Washington University and Legal Affairs Editor of the New Republic. Um, he's a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution as well. Jeff has written widely, including books like The Supreme Court, The Personalities and Rivalries That Defined America. It was a companion book to the award-winning PBS series you may have seen. He's also the author of The Most Democratic Branch, How the Courts Serve America, The Naked Crowd, Freedom and Security in an Anxious Age, and The Unwanted Gaze, The Destruction of Privacy in America. His essays and commentaries have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, the Atlantic Monthly, and on NPR, and in the New Yorker, where he's been a staff writer. Rosen is a graduate of Harvard College, Oxford University, and Yale Law School. And finally, Ted Shaw, Theodore Shaw, professor of professional practice at Columbia University School of Law and of counsel at the law firm Fulbright and Jaworski. For 23 years, Ted Shaw was an attorney at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He served as assistant counsel and director of the education docket, docket, Western regional director, and associate director counsel and before becoming director counsel and president from 2004 to 2008. Currently, he's on the faculty of Columbia Law School where he teaches on civil procedure, constitutional law, and advanced con constitutional law. At Fulbright, his practice involves civil litigation and representation of institutional clients on matters including diversity and civil rights. He's argued before the US Supreme Court and courts of appeals in many cases, and he's tried education, voting rights, housing discrimination, capital punishment, and other civil rights cases in trial courts all over the country. He played a key role in initiating and drafting the admissions policy that was upheld by the US Supreme Court in Grutter v. Bollinger, and he was lead counsel for black and Latino interveners in Gratz v. Bollinger. He's a graduate of Wesleyan University and Columbia Law School. So I'm going to start um, by asking uh, our panelists uh, three or four questions, and then eventually we're going to open it up to questions from you all. So please be thinking of those um, as we move through. Uh, first, as David said, this year is the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And our theme for today's Law Day in places like this all over the country is realizing the dream, equality for all. So I want to ask each of the panelists to reflect a bit on how close are we to realizing that dream? Uh, so I think in answering, thank you so much, Carrie. Sure. I think that in answering that question, so much has to do with how you define equality. And as David was talking, I was thinking more about the Emancipation Proclamation and thinking that 
the question after emancipation wouldn't have been equality, and it wasn't equality, it was freedom. Uh, and just the fact that we're talking about equality and not freedom, I think, shows we've come pretty far, actually, because equality was unthinkable. That, that wasn't, I mean, it wasn't unthinkable, but it, it wasn't realistic or, or particularly possible in 1863, um, or even in 1865 when the Civil War ended. Um, and in fact, after the Civil War ended, a lot of people were still opposed to freedom, and re-enslavement and efforts at re-enslavement were um, made all across the South. And so I, I think one step is from freedom to equality. But then in thinking about how close have we come to equality, I think you have to define equality, right? And I think we've come much closer to some definitions than to others. And in particular, if you think about equality as being a formal matter of what do our laws say and how do our laws classify people, I think we've gotten relatively close, or at least close-ish, um, right, if you think back to Jim Crow, and uh, which existed not only in the South, but also in the North and in various ways. Um, you know, we are no longer a, a nation that, uh, that formally, legally segregates. We are no, no longer a nation that thinks that it's okay to discriminate explicitly by government on the basis of race. Um, but Jim Crow and the inequalities that followed after the end of the Civil War was about so much more than formal government segregation. It was about economic exploitation. It was about material inequality. It was about poverty. And when you think about those kind of uh, measures of equality, I, I think we're a lot further away. When you think about the differential effects of uh, the recession on African American and other minorities, when you think about the wealth gap and poverty and the racialized nature of poverty that continues, um, I, I think that we, we haven't come nearly as far as we have when you're thinking about formal equality. And the last thing I, I, I would say is that even when you're thinking about formal equality, once you move beyond race-based discrimination, uh, I think you're not as close also, right? So formal equality has worked more in certain ways than in others. Uh, and when you think about formal equality on the basis of sexual orientation, say, uh, we haven't moved as far. When you think about formal equality on the basis of alienage, um, right? Uh, one of the big issues, which I assume we'll talk about, is, is undocumented workers and, uh, and, and exclusion. And so uh, even as I think we've made great, greater strides in terms of formal equality than in terms of material equality, I, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say, we're there. <laughs> uh, we've done it. Um, uh, but 150 years is a long time, you know? And, and a lot changes over 150 years. Um, but I don't think it's a, a linear story of you know, success after success. I think there are ways in which we retrench, and there are ways in which we progress. And there are always, uh, so it seems thus far, there are always people who are left out, and always people who are, are kept out on purpose. Rasko, what do you see as somebody who's been looking at this from the education system and now the library for many, many years? Well, I, I find it difficult to separate the dreamer from the dream, actually, because equality can be measured legally by statutes and court rulings, et cetera. And the legal measure is, is critical in order to come to a conclusion, uh, how we, are we there yet? But I think um, extra legal measures are often present more compelling evidence as to whether equality has actually been achieved uh, in fact. And um, to coincide with what you said, Risa, I think when we look at the disparities which exist today in society, the uh, home ownership gap, for instance, when we look at the income gap between uh, whites, blacks, and Latinos, Whites uh, have 22 times more wealth than blacks and 15 times more wealth than Latinos. So by that measure, I don't think we've realized the dream. I think it's more akin to wanting to wake up from it. Um, <clears throat> then we have the educational achievement gap, which has been persistent, chronic, longstanding. No one seems to be able to address why achievement between um, racial groups, students, um, is so, uh, so stark and so, uh, so intractable in terms of addressing and closing that gap. We also have the digital divide. As we know, as we may surmise or assume, um, those who can afford access to the internet and cellular service and 4G networks are the ones who are going to have access to it. So as we sit here today, we have a very stark digital divide in this country. And as we also know, 
those who are not tech savvy or, or um, computer literate are even at a more distinct disadvantage in terms of education and in terms of em employability and in terms of promotability. We have a literacy gap, which the library works very hard at closing. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know the numbers on that. I think there's probably someone in this room that can shed more light on that than I can, but I can assure you the gap hasn't been closed as of today, as of our speaking about realizing the dream. Um, for if you, if you can't read, fill in the blank. What else can't you do? Um, reading is essential to being computer literate. You can't send an email if you don't know how to read. You don't know how to surf the net if you don't know how to read. So all these things seem to have some interconnectivity in terms of has the dream been realized and do we really have equality for all? Finally, I'd like to say the study recently came out that indicated that your, the gap, the income gap can affect life expectancy. There was a study done in Florida, two counties, one relatively wealthy, one very poor. And what they found was the wealthy people live longer than the poor people. So now it's not just a matter of quality of life, educational opportunity, but <coughs> poverty can kill you or kill you sooner than you normally would um, live if you were wealthy. And that has to do with access to medical services, just being aware of preventative treatment strategies, um, uh, being able to afford medication um, and take advantage of certain <clears throat> programs which provide uh, benefits to senior citizens, et cetera. So the, the income gap, the wealth gap, if you will, can, can contribute to your life expectancy. So given these disparities, I would say that there's a lot to be done. A lot has been accomplished in this country, I do believe. Um, I think a lot more needs to be done. We, we, we face some very uh, uncertain challenges in terms of uh, civil rights in, in this country. Um, we are still grappling with some very uh, real issues of hate crimes and backlash against individual, certain individuals in this country. Um, I don't know that the 14th Amendment can necessarily address that, but certainly when you are addressing issues of equality, you have to ask yourself, uh, is that part of the, the dream? Is that part of the dream, Carrie? Or is it part of the nightmare, okay? Uh, immediately after the Boston bombings, uh, Muslim students in Boston were in, in horrible fear of a backlash against them should the individuals identified or the suspects identified be Muslim, and particularly South Asian or Middle Eastern looking Muslims. And much to everyone's surprise, these were real Caucasians from the Caucasus region of Russia, okay? So that was a sigh of relief, a collective sigh of relief in that particular instance, but we have had a number of hate crime incidents in this country uh, per, uh, perpetrated against individuals who weren't even Muslim, but who people thought were Muslim. Um, and so uh, we, we, we've also had in, 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 a, in the backlash against illegal immigration, hate crimes committed against individuals who appear to be Latino or Hispanic. Um, uh, and this, this obtains across the country. And unfortunately, we've also had, and if some jurisdictions have adopted legislation to make it a hate crime, to attack a homeless person. In the state of Florida, um, attacking homeless individuals with a baseball bat was considered a sport. And so the Florida Commission on Human Relations decided to encourage the legislature to pass a law to make it a hate crime. So that's why I say, Risa, who's dreaming the dream? I agree with you completely. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's bring in Jeff Rosen. Jeff Rosen, what's your take on this question of equality for all? How, how close are we to realizing the dream for equality to all? Yeah. I'm struck by the very thoughtful distinctions that Riza and Kirk have introduced between formal or legal equality on the one hand, and then economic or educational equality on the other. 
But then at the end, Kirk introduced this very interesting question. What about the hearts and minds of the people? What about social equality? To what degree are the American people extending the dream of the Emancipi Emancipation Proclamation to previously unrecognized groups? And on that score, there is, in fact, some grounds for hope. I mean, you look at the dizzying shift in the polls about gay marriage, about marriage equality in the past year alone. And it's just stunning to see people changing their minds household by household and person by person. We saw the President of the United States, President Obama, confessing that he'd changed his mind on the question because he'd been persuaded by his wife and daughters. And it turns out that's not an unusual <coughs> phenomenon. Many people, especially many men, who changed their minds about gay marriage had women, often family members or wives, persuade them. And President Clinton, who signed the Defense of Marriage Act, recently renounced his former support and said he had changed his mind and thought it should be struck down by the court because he had been persuaded by his daughter, Chelsea. So that's a pretty stunning example of social equality in action, of people reflecting on the dream of the Emancipation Proclamation and deciding because of the power of reason to abandon their former prejudices and to extend the dream. Uh, and the fact, of course, the, the obvious fact that we have that it was an African-American president, our first African-American president who changed his mind, is further confirmation of the extension of the dream. But that also suggests to me that when we ask about whether the dream has been achieved, we shouldn't look only to formal institutions like the courts or Congress. The President of the United States changed his mind about gay marriage at a time when an overwhelming majority of states, more than 30, still ban gay marriage. It's possible that the US Supreme Court will strike down the Defense of Marriage Act and rule in favor of uh, California's uh, of, of citizens' ability to, to marry. But at the same time, they may, as we'll discuss in a bit, strike down affirmative action and voting rights. So we shouldn't imagine that the courts are inexorable uh, pillars of equality. Uh, over the course of time, as President Obama observes in his book, The Audacity of Hope, it's been engaged citizens, act, active citizens, who have been at the front lines of extending the dream of equality. And often, Congress and the courts have followed or obstructed this dream. After all, it was Congress after the Civil War that passed the 14th Amendment and the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which tried to fulfill President Lincoln's vision of the Emancipation Proclamation. And it was the Supreme Court that struck down the Civil Rights Act, denying the possibility of equality in public accommodations until nearly a century later in Brown versus Board of Education. And even in Brown, as Risa has written better than uh, anyone else, uh, along with her, co her uh, co colleagues like Michael Klarman, uh, uh, equality for African Americans wasn't achieved right after the court spoke. It took the civil rights movement of engaged citizens marching in the streets to make it a reality. So it's a broad question. I think I would say over the course of time, I think of President Roosevelt's last inaugural address. The, you know, the, the cycle goes up and down, but the general trajectory for liberty and equality is upward. People's hearts and minds are generally changed in favor of expanding the circle of those uh, to whom the <coughs> dream of the Emancipation Proclamation is extended. But it's a bumpy and circuitous path. Often the courts and Congress will obstruct it, and it takes committed citizens, active citizens, committed to persuading their fellow citizens to ensure that the dream continues to move forward. Mr. Tedshaw, oh, almost a quarter century at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund where you were in and out of courtrooms fighting on some of these issues. You remain in and out of courtrooms fighting on some of these issues. What's your take? Well, I often uh, like to remind people about historical perspective uh, because as we commemorate the anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, I'm conscious that people like to antique slavery, you know, 150 years ago, long time ago, not relevant to anything that we see now in our society, even though we see uh, the kinds of inequalities that uh, we, we all have been recognizing up here. Uh, but uh, we believe somehow or another that those present day inequalities, those gaps are uh, unconnected to all of that history. Uh, there's another anniversary we're going to commemorate that almost no one's talking about right now in a few years, and that's the anniversary of the first African Americans at Jamestown, uh, and that will be in 2019. 
Uh, and I like to remind people that if we look at the experience of people of African descent in what's now the United States, and start with 1619 and come to the present, uh, we're talking about uh, 393 years. And uh, we can't stop at the Emancipation Proclamation or slavery. We have to look at the continuum of the subordination legally, by law, of African Americans, uh, which is a pretty much a straight line with some nuances continuum starting in 1619 and running right up through the end of the 1960s. Uh, if we look at it that way, uh, you know, the way it works out is that 89% uh, of the days of people of African descent in what's now the United States was spent in either Jim Crow, segregation, or slavery. Nine out of 10 days of African uh, descent people in North America, uh, in what's now the United States specifically. Uh, and the, the, the reason I dwell on that is because that makes this discourse that we see, both the social discourse and the legal discourse, and for that matter, political discourse, uh, which tries to separate out present inequality as measured by all these gaps from all of that history, uh, it's an absurd discourse. Uh, I understand why we engage in it, uh, because as uh, somebody wrote uh, some years ago, and the theme song to a movie that I love, uh, what we s find too painful to remember, we simply choose to forget. Uh, so I get that, I understand that. Uh, having said all that though, um, uh, we're stuck in this position we're in now, uh, in which there's this great irony uh, of colorblindness that we've embraced that comes from Justice Harlan's dissent in uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. And the great irony is that our experience with race has been so toxic that we've created uh, race, or we've equated race, rather, uh, to a third rail. It's the third rail of American politics, and uh, it's such uh, a, um, uh, it's such a, um, a dangerous third rail that we believe that we can't engage in anything that's race conscious now, even if it's for the, if it's for the purpose of addressing that legacy of inequality because somehow we can't figure out what's invidious discrimination and what is uh, not invidious discrimination, what is aimed at trying to address that inequality. So we treat it all the same, almost all the same anyway. Uh, and to me, um, that's a dishonest discourse. But here's the bottom line. Um, you know, it's a tale of two cities. This is an extraordinary country, uh, an extraordinary. There's no other country like this, and I don't say this uh, grounded in this kind of uh, a uh, blind, uh, false patriotism that a lot of people engage in. Uh, you know, the fact that we have an African-American president uh, of the United States still, uh, for me, when I wake up on many mornings, is unbelievable, uh, that kind of progress, uh, that kind of instance. So uh, it's an extraordinary country, extraordinary uh, progress. We're not where we were some years back, uh, but we still have this legacy that uh, uh, that uh, still reaches into our present in ways that we need to continue to wrestle with. Okay, so let's get up right to the present. The Supreme Court right now is um, about to decide sometime in the next two to three months, who really knows, before the end of June, we think, two major cases, um, whether the landmark Voting Rights Act of 1965 is outdated, whether it's still necessary to give um, some states extra hoops to ju jump through before it make, they make election changes, and whether college campuses still need affirmative action in order to realize some of the promises we've been talking about. Uh, what does that tell us, Ted Shaw, about the difficulty in grappling with some of these questions when a lot of people don't want to talk about them, as you said? Well, um... I pause for a minute because I always have to rein myself in if I'm prudent. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> rein on. <laughs> uh, you know, the oral argument in both uh, the Shelby County case involving Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act and in the oral argument in the Fisher case involving the University of Texas, for me, uh, there was a lot of heat and very little light. Um, I was very disappointed in those oral arguments. And I could say a great deal more about um, why that's so. 
Uh, one thing I'll point out in the Fisher case is that because of the, uh, the track that the Supreme Court has been on since Bakke, uh, there was no voice for people of color in that oral argument, for example. Uh, and that matters. Uh, it matters uh, for pra pragmatic reasons. Uh, it matters for symbolic reasons. Uh, and um, uh, I think that uh, where we are is that this court, by a very narrow margin, is poised to, uh, to realize what I call the conservative project on race uh, during this term and the next term. You know, when the Affordable Care Act cases were enacted, uh, rather, when they were upheld by the Supreme Court, and a lot of people said, well, this is a big surprise. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, you know, maybe more liberal than people think he is, and the conservatives were going after him. The first thought I had was, uh, look, if he has any problems with the, his bona fides with the conservative, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, branch of our society, those bona fides are going to be reestablished very quickly uh, at the end of the, uh, the next term. And here we are. Now, I hope I'm wrong. Uh, I pray that I'm wrong. Uh, but I don't think that the Supreme Court took the, uh, the Texas case uh, to reaffirm Grutter. They don't have to reach it, but they may. Uh, and uh, they could do a lot of damage. Now, you asked the question in terms of affirmative action. Uh, technically, this is not about affirmative action. Uh, I mean, it is in a sense, but the Supreme Court, through the remedial justification for uh, race consideration in higher education under the bus in Baki, uh, and left uh, the, um, uh, the diversity justification alive, that's a right that's not grounded in the interest of people of color in access to higher education. That's the university's First Amendment interest. Uh, in uh, diversity as a matter of academic freedom. Now, African Americans, Latinos, others are beneficiaries. We, we know what's really going on, uh, if I can say that and be presumptuous. Uh, but as a matter of law, uh, it's a very different justification. Uh, the Voting Rights Act, all I can say is that um, uh, anybody who's watching knows that there are still attempts to fence people out of uh, the political processes of the right to vote. Uh, and we have a long history, as we've uh, referred to, with respect to uh, certain jurisdictions. The Voting Rights Act, Section 5, isn't always going to be in, uh, in place. I, I was involved in advocating uh, and working for the extension of Section 5. Uh, but um, uh, now the court seems poised to strike it down. Uh, there are still jurisdictions that engage in all kinds of conduct that uh, fence people out of political processes, uh, and to make jurisdictions with a history of discrimination uh, show that they're not perpetuating uh, the discrimination they've engaged in in the past, to me it's not too heavy a burden. Uh, but I, I'm skeptical about uh, whether Section 5 is going to survive. Jeff Rosen, you follow the work of the court closely. Um, what do these two cases this term, the uh, uh, diversity at the University of Texas uh, case and the Voting Rights Act case tell us about this question of equality and maybe that bumpy and circuitous path you referenced earlier. They tell us that there is a clash between two powerful and mutually inconsistent visions of equality in the Constitution. And one vision says, as Justice Harlan did in his Plessy dissent, that the Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens, and that any attempt by the government to classify on the basis of race is presumptively constitutionally suspicious. The other view says with equal passion that uh, the 14th Amendment is intended to prohibit stigmatizing classifications, racial classifications that degrade, that affirm a racial caste system, and laws intended to include and unite citizens rather than exclude and divide them. Benign racial classifications as opposed to pernicious ones are presumptively constitutional. Now, there are good arguments on behalf of both of these principles. And when I teach these cases uh, in, in constitutional law, I begin by saying uh, there are no harder cases under the Constitution. And you've got to separate your constitutional views from your political views and try to pick the principle you find most persuasive. Now, speaking for myself, I think that although the colorblind view 
has powerful appeal and can be rooted in the text of the 14th Amendment, it is hard to root in its original understanding. And in fact, Justice Harlan in Plessy did not assert a broad principle of colorblindness across the board. He said only in respect of civil rights is colorblindness required. And in his day, civil rights were a very narrow category of rights that did not include voting rights. So he would not have supported the idea that the Voting Rights Act is subject to this colorblindness requirement. And it's even questionable whether he would have thought that schools and education were covered by this mandate. So it is an irony that the justices who ordinarily claim to be devoted to the original understanding of the Constitution in other cases are embracing a colorblindness principle that's far more abstract than the framers of the 14th Amendment would have embraced. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a very strong view. So what will happen? I, I think Ted very accurately sums up the strong possibility that the court, uh, either by five solid votes or four and a half, with Kennedy providing you know, almost complete uh, support, with a little hedge about maybe come back and see me later, or maybe I'll change my mind, or I'm not quite sure. But you know, but basically the writing, the writing is on the wall whether Grutter is overturned or not. What will happen? Well, one lesson that we learned from the circuitous history of the court and equality is that the court never has the last word. It's not a pretty picture when it comes to the court and equality. You think of the high watermark of Reconstruction, all of those glorious post-war statutes culminating in the Civil Rights Act of 1875, all struck down struck down by the Supreme Court on the grounds of you know, the, 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 uh, sec Section 5 or the Commerce Clause or, or various ruses, but just a, a, a refusal to defer to the considered judgment of the, of, the, of the people of the United States and the bloody civil war that it took to create the thing. What will happen? I think that the referenda in California and Texas and elsewhere suggests that even when states have tried to ban affirmative action, especially in higher education, the demand for it is so strong as a matter of political legitimacy that universities will explore other options. It's perceived by state legislatures that universities can't function as legitimate institutions in a democratic society unless they look like America. That's exactly why Texas, having already embraced its 10% plan, thought that it needed an additional bit of race conscious admission or else individual classrooms were uh, not integrated and there were not enough uh, African American and minority students in cases in, in classes involving science, technology, and uh, engineering. So if, 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 the, if the court you know, uh, strikes down the Texas plan, universities are already exploring race-neutral ways of using race as a proxy, such as data mining. They found, for example, that there are certain neighborhoods where um, race correlates strongly with geographic residents. And by using the same kind of data mining programs that Amazon uses to predict what kind of books you're going to buy, you may be able to identify applicants who correlate with the basis of race without actually using race. I'm not going to say it's not going to be hard, but we shouldn't imagine that the court ever has the last word. This is a constant battle between the people, the legislature, and the courts. I want to turn to Kirk because you've spent most of your career in higher education on issues of inclusiveness, and you're doing that here now. What is your take on whether the courts are going to have the last word on these issues? And, and from your experience, how, how are people on the ground going to handle this? Well. As my colleague Ted said, let me rein myself in. <laughs> um, one of the things you should know about higher, higher education is sometimes it's not all that high, OK? Um, they are, I don't mean that way. I mean, <laughs> we didn't inhale. Lofty. Yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not all yeah. that lofty. Yeah, yeah. We it's, got you. <laughs> sometimes, it's, sometimes it's very self-serving, um, and I think uh, Many institutions have uh, seized upon the opportunity to um, exploit the deference that Grutter gave them uh, for diversity, to explore other areas, uh, other unintended areas that um, the court really did not speak to. So now we have a movement afoot, which um, I think in the, ultimately in the end it will be beneficial for the country as well as our institutions of higher education. There's a movement of, afoot to expand diversity beyond traditional racial, ethnic, and gender uh, paradigm. It's, there's discussion about there should be social and economic diversity in institutions of higher education because I don't know whether you know it or not, one of the reasons uh, Ted Kaczynski, who went to Harvard, the Unabomber, he felt, he was a white male, he felt alienated, ostracized, teased because he came from a poor family. Um, he was wearing old clothes and worn out clothes and 
this created, and he was teased about it, and this created in him hostility toward the elite, okay, of Harvard. Not to pick on Harvard. I see you looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> Go red, okay. But um, no, but you, you, you understand my point. So now diversity has, has expanded. Now it's, we're talking about social, socioeconomic diversity. We're talking about geographical diversity. You can't have all people from the Northeast or all people from the Southeast or all people from the Southwest in one institution and expect your students to uh, extract from that an educational experience which prepares them for a world in which we're all global citizens. Okay, um, there, so now what was intended for colleges and universities to use race or gender as one of many factors, now colleges and universities are saying, hey, this is an opportunity for us to diversify, and quite often that also has a financial benefit for them. Because as we all know, for public institutions, out of state students pay more tuition than in-state residents. So what is happening in higher education is in the name of diversity, public colleges and universities are going after international students. So right now in this country, most of our institutions, our public institutions of higher learning are soliciting students from India, Korea, China. China has more MBA students in the United States probably than than uh, they have in China. Um, and similar, similar types of, of issues are going on in terms of international student programs, et cetera. So now we have an unintended consequence of a decision by the Supreme Court 10 years ago um, that while on its face it seems to favor inclusion, diversity, come together over me, and now it's being used as a, as a financial strategy to save colleges from these escalating tuition costs by providing a population that can afford to pay these escalating costs and who see American higher education as a premium uh, content valuable experience worth the extra money. On the converse of that, because tuition has escalated over and over and over again without any seeming end in sight, Many American students are seeking opportunities abroad to go to college. We have an increase in population of American students who are seeking higher education in Canada because it's often much uh, uh, up to 75% less expensive than an, American, an equivalent American institution. Um, we also have our, our young people who can't find work are seeking employment abroad. So this is, is, is an indication of how these decisions sometimes have unintended consequences in society. Something that was intended for um, admissions and by way of extrapolation, financial aid application, now is taking on a life of its own. Um, and I don't think, I think in the long run, I think it'll be, it will work out to, to the advantage of American society. But I think in the short run, it doesn't really address the issue. Because at American colleges and universities right now, you're having incidents um, on campus with students. There was an incident at University of California, Irvine, about two weeks ago, where Asian students in an Asian fraternity uh, dressed up in blackface and were imitating Jay-Z. Um, you have incidents in Texas and in the Southwest where uh, and in California where individuals have uh, uh, illegal immigrant parties and dress up like what they, what they call um, uh, mojados or wetbacks or whatever and wear sombreros and say, you know, people come dressed up as these different characters. So if diversity is all that beneficial for the educational experience, one would question why we're continuing to have these incidents on campus. Um, and have them in, in relatively uh, open fashion. They're captured on Facebook and YouTube and doesn't seem to be any, uh, any shame involved in, in conducting these activities. So I think, I, I think there needs to really be a serious discussion as to what, where, what, what is the expectation of diversity in public 
higher education, higher education in general. What is the expectation in the workplace? Risa, what, do you, what, have, what is the fact that the Supreme Court is now wrestling with um, the legitimacy of at least one of the most effective, by all accounts, parts of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the notion that once again, after uh, you know a period starting in 1978 and moving to now, affirmative action and diversity in schools is still a problem that it's wrestling with. I mean, I think I think it really goes back a lot um, uh, to both what Ted was saying and um, what Jeff was saying because. I think that it's a particular understanding of history that informs whether you believe in anti-discrimination or anti-subordination, right? So if you think that what happened, what, slavery was 150 years ago, segregation was 60 years ago, and now we're past that, then you're more like, that correlates with the idea that just thinking about race is problematic and we can think neutrally about how you think about race and it's all problematic. But if you actually think, and I agree with you, Ted, if you actually think that uh, racial inequality and subordination is not something in the distant past, is something that has continued with us forever. And I wouldn't even limit it to the end of segregation. I actually think um, that, uh, that government involvement uh, in the perpetuation of inequality even past that time it continues in, in, in lots of ways and in lots of settings. Um, and so if you think that race discrimination and racial inequality are not something of the distant past, then you think the harm isn't government thinking about race. The harm is the existence of racial inequality. And I, and I think a lot of this goes to thinking about the public and the private. Um, so uh, the 14th Amendment says that no state shall deny uh, any person of the equal protection of the laws. And that was uh, identified and defined by the Supreme Court uh, in the 19th century in the cases that Jeff was talking about as requiring only governmental action to not deprive anyone of equal protection. And I don't actually think that that was a necessary interpretation. And there were moments in the 20th century, especially in the 1940s uh, and early 1950s, when the court kind of flirted with whether or not you could have a constitutional claim that private parties were violating your constitutional rights and that the government had a responsibility to protect you affirmatively. Uh, and the original meanings of affirmative action were not what we think they are today. They were that government had an affirmative obligation to protect individuals from private harms as well as public harms. And I think that we lost the ability to talk about government's implication in so many kinds of private harms. And so now when we look around, we see all the kinds of things that you were talking about, Kirk, um, all of the inequalities that you're talking about, and people say, they're epiphenomenal. They just are. Uh, government's not Im embedded in those. Uh, the Constitution can't do anything about them. I don't know why black people seem to be poor. Um, and, and that's not what I see. And I think it's a real problem that, uh, that the way we talk about the Constitution and the way we talk about law is we fixed those problems, right? So when I was saying before, I think we have to talk about formal equality versus material equality, I don't say that because I think we should let anyone off the hook for material equality. It's because I think we have myths about what we can fix and what we can't fix that, that disable us from actually fixing the inequality that remains. And those myths are deeply related to our historical understandings that know this is far away in the past. And, and I don't think that's true. And, and I, I think you, you could really see that I was at the, the oral argument for the voting rights case, and you could really see that in the way the justices were talking about, uh, about what the Voting Rights Act was meant to do. And some of the justices said, the Voting Rights Act was just meant to make sure that people weren't totally excluded from voting. That's not what the Voting Rights Act was meant to do. It was meant to enable people who had been completely disenfranchised for 100 years uh, to participate in the political process on every level, not just could they actually go register to vote? But the reason that the justices who were advocating that position were saying it was because if that's the problem, we fixed it. Great, and then you can get rid of the Voting Rights Act. But if you understand the problem to be bigger, more intransigent, more structural, more historically rooted, and to continue into today, then the Voting Rights Act obviously has to continue, right? Because we haven't uh, uh, overcome what are much more deeply uh, entrenched structural and historical problems and the consequences that flow from them. We're running a little low on time. 
Um, I'm going to ask one more question, a lightning round, even though we're not, you know, on the McLaughlin show here. And then, um, <laughs> but now's a good time if anybody in the audience has questions. Um, there'll be somebody uh, passing note cards around. Please do, um, we, are, we already have. Uh, please do send up your questions, and we'll hope to get to a couple of them. So lightning round, um, a couple of things that have come up from the panel already. Um, new frontiers for some of these issues, um, immigration, um, LGBT, um, people with disabilities. Where do you think this conversation is going for the next 20, 25 years? Well, I think the, uh, you know, the, um, one of the wonders of what we think of as the American Civil Rights Movement of the uh, 20th century is that it opened the door to a series of movements and, and the adoption <coughs> wide scale of principles of non-discrimination, whether we're talking about gender, now sexual orientation, whether we're talking about disabilities, uh, you know, across the board, who and what we are uh, should not be the basis of subordination. Um, those are wonderful principles, uh, and uh, I think that will continue. Uh, I agree with what Jeffrey said about, uh, for example, uh, you know, what will happen even post uh, Fisher. Uh, colleges and universities will work to find a way because these principles have become ingrained in who and what we are as a nation, and it's impossible to go back. Um, let me share, if I can, very quickly one thought, though. Um, I still think that there's a a narrow set of issues that impact uh, the sons and the daughters, the descendants of, of those who were in slavery and Jim Crow segregation that have to be addressed. There's a, a, a bubbling discourse that's, that, that's going on in higher education. People are beginning to be aware of this. If you look at uh, where I teach Columbia Law School, I've heard people at Harvard talk about this, at selective institutions. Yes, there are black students there, but disproportionately, they tend to be uh, increasingly the sons and the daughters of African and Caribbean immigrants. Let me be clear. I'm glad they're there. I want to be very clear about that. Uh, I'm, it's important that they're there. Uh, but who you don't see there increasingly are the descendants of the American slavery to Jim Crow segregation. And I don't think, although you might think I take this too far, I don't think it's coincidental that the first African American president uh, is himself, uh, not from that experience. I mean, he's, some people say he's questioned whether he's African American. Clearly he is. You know, clearly he's more than that. He's biracial. Uh, but I'm saying that African Americans from that Jim Crow and slavery uh, experience, that legacy, are still being wiped out and wiping themselves out in some ways. And we need to be able to address that. And we can't have our hands tied by the simplistic um, and sometimes intellectually dishonest notions of what colorblindness commands and what it doesn't command. Jeff, where do you see this conversation going? Will the equality norm, or what Risa called the anti-subordination norm, extend to other groups like LGBT groups and so forth? It has to. The logic is inexorable. Once the Supreme Court embra embraces the principle, as it basically has, that laws may not be passed for the purpose of stigmatizing or degrading a particular group, then it's hard to sustain, for example, the Arizona law, which has been proposed but I think not yet passed, that would require all people to use bathrooms associated with the gender marked on their birth certificate. So this would require LGBT people to use uh, the, the bathroom that uh, is uh, associated with the gender marked on their birth certificate. And clearly the only purpose of this law was to stigmatize and degrade LGBT people. I don't doubt that you know, courts, if the law is passed, will strike it down. More broadly, uh, though, in the spirit of my thought that it's not just courts that are going to lead this charge, what are the great civil rights and civil liberties issues of the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years going to be? They're going to have to involve emerging technologies and the internet and surveillance technologies. And this may just be my uh, you know, uh, personal focus, but I think the question of whether we have any expectation of public anonymity will raise huge civil rights questions. An age when drone cameras will be able to target individuals and follow them 24-7 that will make the kind of GPS tracking that the Supreme Court recently considered look obsolete. A time when Google Glass will allow us to record our conversations with each other in public, both uh, audio and visual, and broadcast those to the world, transforming our nature of public space and requiring us to ask whether particular conversations are on or off the record will make it more difficult for vulnerable groups, LGBT groups, protest groups, uh, African Americans, uh, uh, women, to go to abortion clinics, to engage in protests, to have unpopular 
political associations and the question of whether there is a basic right of public anonymity that will prohibit not only the government but our fellow citizens from tracking us 24-7 in public, whether there's some sphere of immunity that allows us to control what Justice Brandeis said, the thoughts, sensations, and emotions that we communicate to each other, all of this has to do with how we form our identities, not only as individuals, but as members of groups, and I think they're gonna raise huge questions about equality as well. Thank you. Rosco? I think that's a fascinating prospect, Jeffrey. But I also think that, you know, like the Doobie Brothers said, a lot happens when you take it to the streets, okay? <laughs> um, here, here. And in that context, I would remind you that as Ted said, and as, as, as Risa has said, it's been mobilized, concerted action on the part of the people that has moved this agenda. It has not been a jurisprudential intellectual movement. Um, and that goes for the civil rights movements, the women's movements, the gay movement, the disability movement. Each one of those movements took place and took off in the street. So our young people, our 20 and 30 year olds who um, have been witness to some of the most uh, life-changing events in, in, in the 20 and 21st century, have taken note of this. And the court, the Supreme Court, as well as the Congress, they're taking note of this too. Because for those of us who lived during the 60s, it wasn't all about just writing letters to the editor, okay? It was about <laughs> sit-ins, protests, okay? Going and raising hell, as they say. And so we see that model being replicated over and over in other, in other areas. And so I would say that the area that I feel is going to be most interesting to observe is the um, is a movement associated with individuals with disabilities. And this is coming at a time when technology is able to ameliorate many of the conditions which we consider to be disabling. Um, so you have two uh, seemingly contradictory uh, uh, significant uh, trends occurring at the same time. Technology is able to address some of these issues so you don't have a disabling condition but the people who consider themselves to be individuals with disabilities are insisting upon being treated equally and fairly. And so that's going to be an interesting trend to watch. I think the whole issue with the um, uh, LGBT community is a question of when worlds collide. Because if you ask anybody, they're going to say, yes, we believe in equal rights, but if I'm a Christian, I should not have to allow you to adopt a, a, a child if I'm running a Catholic adoption agency and you're, you're a gay couple. I just refuse to do that. Where's my First Amendment right to worship as I please, okay? So when worlds collide, then we get some sparks, we get some heat, we get some, we get some subatomic particles flying off from this discussion, <laughs> do we not, okay? So I think, I, I, I think we have to look at it in that context. These movements, these clashes, these when, when these dreams collide, they create issues for the rest of us to learn from. And an and, and important fact, and I, 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 I owe due deference to my good friend and colleague Ted Shaw, I just don't think it's a black-white dynamic anymore. Number one. Oh, neither do I. I, 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 I think there's a, a much broader conversation going on. Yeah, and I'm I, just saying it's un, unfinished business with respect to black folks. But I think that there's a lot of people who are, having, who are having civil rights fatigue with black folks talking about slavery. Am I, am I getting close to anybody out there? They always They're getting a little tired of hearing about that. Okay, let's move on to something or someone else. Let's have some fresh dialogue. We've been, we've been I, and I'm not, saying, I'm not saying it's right to do that. I'm saying it exists. We cannot deny it that always it has. exists, okay? And especially our younger people, black, white, and Latino, they are giving decreased emphasis. Our college age uh, young adults and our, our young adults in the workforce, they give decreased emphasis to race and to sexual orientation and to religion and to all these things that we're so animated about and we want to go to the streets about and we got a lot to talk about. They're like, we don't see what the big deal is. And in the states where, where, where gay marriage passed, it was the young people who passed it. Why? Because they don't see what the big, let these people marry who they want to marry, let's move on to something else. Where, where marijuana was, was made legal, it was the young people who legalized it. 
It wasn't the, uh, it wasn't the 65 and older set who legalized marijuana. <laughs> They said, uh, give these people actually, their pot and uh, actually, <laughs> let uh, my people go, okay? Uh, so, I'm sorry, no, I, I, no, Risa. Let me bring in Risa, who, who introduced this issue of, of immigration and, and undocumented people. Do you, you think that's going to be the touchstone for the next 25 years? I, I, I don't think there's going to be any one touchstone okay. for, for the next 25 years, um, and I'll talk really quickly. Please. I, I, but, Partly, I'm a historian. I don't usually look forward. I look back. Um, but when I look back, and especially when I look at the 60s, which my the, the book I'm working on currently is about, what I see is there are always lots of movements. And actually, dreams are always colliding, right? So when you have a movement against Jim Crow, man, that's dreams colliding, right? <laughs> I mean, there are people vested in that system. And, uh, and it is almost always the case that there's somebody on the other side of a rights claim who either thinks they have a rights claim to or has some kind of claim to that security or that spot or, uh, or, or that workplace or, you know, and, and so I think dreams are always colliding and that's how it's always been and, and I, so I think that will continue to be and, but I don't think there'll be any one single issue. But if I could say one last Please. thing, I think the other thing um, to watch as these dreams collide and as these movements progress is um, the un unique way in which movements uh, have to handle change in America, right? So um, we have both a federalist system and a system with separation of powers, right? And so you can see different aspects of the federal government working in different ways at different moments, right? So after the Civil War, Congress is saying, yes, rights, and the court is saying no. And then by the 1940s and 1950s, the Southern Democrats in Congress are stymieing every civil rights bill that gets put up, and it's the court who acts again, maybe, you know, to fix what they, what the problems they created you know, 75 years earlier. Um, uh, and similarly, you see the court in brown at the head, uh, and at least the southern states are, are pushing back, but eventually the northern states too pushing back. Uh, today, you see the court more conservative, and so a lot of the action is happening in the states, right? And so I think no matter which of the issues it is, you want to be attuned to where is it happening on the local level, on the state level, on the federal level, and who are the movers at the federal level, and how are the three branches of government interacting with each other to either push forward uh, change toward greater equality or not. Bumpy and circuitous. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have time, I think, for one question. I don't want to cheat people out of the rare and extraordinary <laughs> chance to view the Emancipation Proclamation. So we'll, we'll really, really keep it short. Um, OK. Um, here's the question. Are we going backwards with the growing percentage of young black men in prison? Uh, I, I don't know whether I would describe it as going backwards, uh, but uh, the incarceration rates of African Americans, many of them men, uh, largely driven by drug policy, uh, you know, nonviolent offenders, um, also uh, Latinos. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the great shames uh, of our nation right now. Uh, and it's difficult to imagine that uh, we, could, we could be where we are. Uh, but um, uh, when we talk about progress, uh, there, there isn't any uh, real lasting progress unless we get at this issue. Um, there's a great deal that we could say about it, but I think it's, it is one of the great uh, as I said, uh, uh, shaming uh, issues of our time. Professor Rosen, Congress did do something in the last couple of years to try to reduce the disparities in sentencing um, for people caught with crack cocaine versus powder cocaine, which had a, a vast racial differential. Um, but by many people's uh, telling, that was not nearly enough. It wasn't. Uh, it was welcome, but very briefly, uh, uh, scholars like David Kennedy uh, and Judge Alm in Hawaii have showed that the best way of reducing the uh, African-American prison population, which is a national scandal, would be to reform, as Ted suggested, rules about probation and parole. And if you didn't have mandatory re-admission for low-level uh, parole violations, often involving low-level drug crimes, that would go a long way toward absolutely uh, slashing uh, the indefensible number of African-American young men who are in jail. And do you think that the notion that prison and jail costs eat up so much of federal and state budgets 
might uh, be a prompt for further action in this area? I think, I think it might. I mean, I wouldn't be too optimistic uh, when, uh, when you talk about um, law professors like to talk about interest groups and, and political scientists like to talk about interest groups and how laws get made and prisoners really don't have a lot of power in the <laughs> lobbying. Um, and, uh, and so I think that's a huge problem. But I, I, you have seen during the recession uh, s yeah. states starting to say, oh my God, look at how much money we're spending to keep in prison nonviolent offenders and, and we have other things we might want to spend the money on. So uh, money does talk and uh, I, don't think that, I don't think that it's the only thing that's going to make change happen, uh, but certainly uh, it, it, has, it has changed the calculus to some extent lately. I, I think that hadn't been thought about enough uh, in the past and I, I agree, of course, with everything that Jeff and Ted said. Kirk, not to drag you back into the, don't the drag old me, conversation. Please. But um, do you have thoughts on this and in, in, in the educational access in particular to this population? Well, I think that everything is, uh, every, every issue has its day. Um, I think what we're witnessing right now with the increasing, with the increased diminishing um, revenue that we have to throw at an issue, we have to look at other ways to raise money. That's going to give impetus, it may not happen tomorrow, it's going to give impetus to a re-evaluation of drug policy. We're not going to be able to spend billions and billions of dollars of tracking bales of marijuana coming over from, from, from overseas or wherever. Um, we can uh, balance the budget and have a surplus without raising taxes just if we legalize marijuana, okay? so. And we could empty out some of our, we can make a lot of prison space available. If we, come on, Risa, okay? <laughs> There's plenty of good room in that prison when you let the marijuana people out of there. And I'm not, I'm not advocating that for any particular reason, but I'm, I'm just saying. I'm glad you added that, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm glad you added that. Um, I'm getting the signal that uh, it's time to wrap up. Thank you so okay, much, everyone, thank you. for all of your thoughts. wonderful panel and moderate, moderator up here. As I mentioned earlier, this is a new format for us. We tried to structure this as a conversation, and I think it really worked. Uh, thank you again. And um, in addition to this new format, this is a new uh, thing, if you will, that we're trying here at the Library of Congress. In addition to this uh, panel uh, speaking today, we've tried to tie together other things that we're doing at the Library of Congress. So you may have come today based on an ad that you've seen, and we've tied together lots of different things going on uh, during this week, which we have put under the theme of igniting conversations, illuminating minds. And so I hope you'll take a, um, advantage of some of the other programs that we have going on uh, that are sponsored by not only us, uh, the European Division, the Library Center for the Book, the Kluge Center, the Poetry and Literature Center, all of these uh, different programs that we hope will illuminate you and ignite conversations. Uh, two quick things. Um, there is a reception afterwards, as, as I had indicated. The food is here. And I just remind everyone again, please try to keep the food and drink in here. And we will have the Emancipation Pro Proclamation, the draft of it, uh, outside on display for about 30 minutes. Um, and I hope that our speakers will be able to stay for a few questions if you have a, a couple of follow-ups that you'd like. Um, and one last thing, um, we're trying something new too in terms of trying to gauge what our audience thinks about what we've done. I believe there's a survey floating around. If you take some time and just quickly fill that out for, for, out for us, we'd really appreciate it. So thank you again for coming and uh, look forward to more of our programs this coming year. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.